Hello students, this is Professor Kraus, and we are moving into week five, where we're going to be starting out looking at what might be called, what is often called Christ-centered preaching. We're going to look at it in two different parts. This first part is going to be pulling some information from this book, not one of your required books, but a very, very good and basic book on gospel-centered preaching in the, both the Old and New Testaments. It has some very basic ideas for Christ-centered preaching and how to do it from both Testaments. Uh, in part two, lecture 14, we're going to look more specifically at what we can draw from this humongous book, Him We Proclaim, Preaching Christ from All the Scriptures. So let's open up with prayer. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the hope that we find in Him. Thank you for the, the foundation we have for preaching and uh, what an honor it is to study your word and to prepare uh, Christ-centered, gospel-centered sermons to uh, share with your people, to build them up and to share with the lost each week uh, so that they can hear the good news and believe and be saved. I pray you would help me as a professor to teach this material clearly for all the students to be able to uh, um, understand and uh, be encouraged in what they're doing, hopefully even sharpen their skills. And God, we do it all for you and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just thinking about it at a, at a basic level, I mean, shouldn't Christ-centered preaching be easy in the New Testament? Because you know, the first four books are all about Jesus. Following are uh, the the reality of Jesus and his saving work being lived out in a community uh, isn't Christ-centered preaching, you know, just sort of automatic when you preach the New Testament and you reference Jesus. Um, you know, it, it reveals to us in thinking about these questions that how we define Christ-centered preaching is very important. That Christ-centered preaching is actually more than just saying the word Jesus or pointing to something that he did in his life. Uh, Christ-centered preaching at its core is a model of preaching that seeks to faithfully proclaim Christ from all of Scripture, including the New Testament, which we're studying, uh, following the example of Jesus and Paul and the apostles. But what does it actually look like to preach Christ faithfully from the preaching passages in the New Testament? Um, uh, I've I've spoken about this uh, this pastor named Jeff before. This there's another uh, conversation that I had with him, ongoing conversation I had with him that I think is relevant to this uh, this lecture. And it as I began to study at Southeastern Seminary and was studying, um, not even specifically preaching at the time, but as I had what we would call Christ-centered preaching, gospel-centered preaching modeled for me week in and week out in chapel and, and beginning to listen to some of the uh, preachers uh, that came to chapel, uh, I realized that what they were doing was drastically different than Pastor Jeff. And, you know, Pastor Jeff was, was my boss technically. I was a youth pastor and he was pastor. Um, and so I sat down to have you know just a conversation with Jeff, uh, hoping to learn from him. And what I mean by learning from him is this wasn't some sort of trap where I went to the office and said, "Hey, this is what you're doing wrong." But you know, as, as someone who was over me, he was the pastor. I was a youth pastor, and and wanting to learn. Um, and be given opportunities to preach, uh, I began just to ask questions about it. And what became very clear was that uh, Pastor Jeff thought that really Christ-centered preaching meant giving a gospel invitation at the end of a, a sermon, which is, which is great, you know, inviting people to respond to the good news they heard. The problem was what I noticed the more I learned about Christ-centered preaching and preaching the gospel is that um, he wasn't really preaching the gospel in the sermon. Old Testament or New Testament, he was seeking to, to preach it faithfully to what was in front of him, but there was very little to any mention of Jesus or what he had accomplished and how that changed the significance of a passage um, outside of a passage that just, you know, John three sixteen something that was very blatant. And so the more and more I talked with him, I realized we... 
that that he didn't really understand what Christ-centered preaching is as as we know it to be and what we're going to be talking about today. And the more and more I convinced I became that this is something I had to to learn about and I had to practice in my preaching and teaching with the youth and sharing the gospel in both the Old Testament and New Testament. Um, uh, a, a man named Charles, uh, let's say, hypothetical man named Charles, he preaches sermons from the Old Testament and New Testament, but he spends the last five minutes of every sermon sharing the gospel and why listeners should believe and be saved. Is that Christ-centered preaching? That's kind of what Jeff was doing. Then there's Ed, who emphasizes who Christ is, what he did, and how we can live like him in every sermon, but he often ignores the context and message of the passage he's preaching from. Is this Christ-centered preaching? I would argue no to both of them. Christ-centered preaching is more than a gospel invitation at the end of every sermon. Christ-centered preaching is more than only talking about Jesus and his work on the cross every single sermon. Christ-centered preaching is, is not trying to find Jesus in every single verse. And we're going to talk a lot more about what Christ-centered preaching is and isn't in round two, uh, in part two, when we look at um, Him We Proclaim. But Christ-centered preaching, again, seeks to faithfully interpret the Scriptures and in their context and to explain and apply how the person and work of Christ matters to that passage. That's the difference between you know, both Charles and Ed. Um, it's kind of the middle ground. It's, it's where we are being faithful to a passage uh, while in, the, in, our, in our minds asking, so what? What does the reality of who Jesus is and what he's accomplished, how does that m- change the way we understand the passage possibly, maybe even apply it, um, the hope that we have because of it, but at the same time not ignoring the passage itself. We're not just reading a passage, making two comments, and then jumping to Jesus um, in, in, in our preaching. That's not, I don't believe, Christ-centered preaching either. Christ-centered preaching is biblical. And these, these, even though, again, this is not your textbook, these are good, um, what do you call them, uh, quotes from this book. Maybe to encourage you if you're wanting to uh, read more. You can see pretty small book, but it's good and clear. It'd be an excellent book to take new preachers through. Uh, Jesus and his disciples interpreted the scriptures, which for them was the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, in light of the person and work of Jesus Christ, the Messiah King, right? They didn't have the New Testament. They had the Old Testament. And yet, um, both Jesus and the apostles that followed interpreted all of scripture and then preached it in light of the person and work of Jesus Christ. They didn't just preach the Old Testament. They preached the Old Testament um, in light of Jesus um, and his salvific work on the cross. Uh, every Christian preaching, or early Christian preaching, excuse me, had a central controlling message and a specific evangelistic purpose. Uh, that is noticeable not only in the apostles, but also in the early church. The central controlling message, whether they're preaching Old Testament or New Testament as the centuries went by, was. Christ and Christ crucified, but that did not mean that they did not faithfully preach the passages um, in and of themselves and then ask those additional questions. So what? Based on Jesus' life and death and resurrection and ascension. But it also had an evangelistic purpose, knowing that there would be those who were non-believers, they would preach uh, faithfully. Now, if this is this is uh, going to be a passage we continue to come back to for, for obvious reasons, Luke chapter 24, uh, there's going to be another lecture later on this week on uh, what I call missional preaching, which is what I did my uh, dissertational, dis- dissertation um, on, and um, it's also based on these passages of Scripture. But this is foundation. You know, this is Jesus after his death and resurrection. He's walking uh, and with some disciples, and he begins to teach, preach, open up their minds to understand who he is and what the 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 importance of what he's done for the rest of Scripture. For Luke 24, 25 through 27, we read, And Jesus said to these disciples, O foolish ones, and slow in heart to believe. All that the prophets have spoken. 
Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them all in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so you know that that passage when we read it as it is, it's it's not saying that Jesus just went through and cherry picked different passages and like, you know, this passage is about me and hey, here's another one. No. He explained how all the scripture was ultimately pointing to him, uh, who he was, why he came, and what he was going to accomplish. He opened their eyes to understand that, you know. Um, they he, he accused them of being slow in heart to believe what the the prophets have spoken. And if we're not familiar with the Old Testament and Christ-centered hermeneutics and preaching, we might scratch our heads and say, but where did the prophets specifically talk about Jesus? And that's the point. If we don't understand the, the centerpiece of the Bible is God's saving and re- redeeming work in, in His Son Jesus, then it's easy just to pass by and just skip to the New Testament before we get to Jesus. But we can't do that. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't teach His disciples to do that. Jesus is stating that all of the Holy Scriptures had a central message and purpose to proclaim the person and work of Jesus, the promised prophet, priest, and king. Now, when we look at verse 44 through 49, I believe it's even more clear what's going on. Jesus said to them, when he appears to his disciples, These are my words I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Right? So that's the the centerpiece of who Jesus is and what he's done. You know, that it it is written, right? The Old Testament, that's all that was written at that point. It is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day and rise from the dead. So we turn to the Old Testament, we might not see that as clearly as we want to, and yet it's there, Jesus says. It's there throughout the Old Testament, who he was and what he was coming to do. But in verse 47, not only was it written that Christ should suffer on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. So he's saying that all of Scripture, the Old Testament, and then of course we obviously believe the New Testament too, It was all about how Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness because Christ has won the victory should now be preached, um, proclaimed in his name to all the the nations. And so that's it. Jesus stating that all the Holy Scriptures had this message and purpose. Um, Therefore, what? Therefore, we must learn from what Jesus is teaching his disciples and learn from what the disciples do in the New Testament in their own preaching and the early church did and then continue in that pattern of understanding Jesus as the centerpiece of Scripture um, and human history and preaching all of Scripture in light of him and his saving work. So you think about when we get to, for example, Jesus and John 6, where Jesus teaches on the bread of life. You know, Jesus is pulling from where? He's pulling from Exodus. And he's pull, pulling from the, the the manna that was given to God's people when they were complaining and they were grumbling against God that now they would have food. And Jesus says, you know, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing that Jesus had come to be the bread of life. What was Jesus doing? He was taking the Old Testament passage and he was revealing an even greater meaning or significance to it. He was showing how it, it in in some way they 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 never would have saw it, you know, in the Old Testament. They were living out God was the provider. God is their savior, the one who saved them out of Israel and is now providing for them the food to to sustain them. But Jesus says, you know, it's even pointing forward. It, it, it was pointing forward to a, a spiritual bread, a bread that anyone who eats, they will never hunger again. You know, Jesus is the, the living water. The, the, Jesus was the, the water who, when someone drinks of him, will never, they'll never be thirsty again. So Jesus not only teaches that's what we should do, we should interpret Scripture in light of him and his mission, but also reveals how to do it in his own preaching. When we get to the book of Acts and the Apostles, in the chapter 2 and chapter 13, we find sermons 
where they preach Old Testament passages but then explain and apply them in light of the person and work of Christ. Help them to see the full significance of what that passage meant then, but also what does it mean now in light of Jesus' saving work, his resurrection from the grave, his ascension to his throne um, in heaven. And just as we do that for Old Testament passages, we have to do the same thing for New Testament passages. Well, you know, just because I'm preaching from the Gospel of Luke and I'm preaching about Jesus healing doesn't mean I just preach Jesus healing and I'm like, I stop there. Like, Jesus healed. He can heal you too, right? I just stop. That, that's, that's not Christ-centered preaching. I've got to better understand exactly what was Jesus doing. How does this point to, you know, the uh, new heavens and new earth? You know, how does this point to the ultimate reason why Jesus came? That's what we're trying to get at with Christ-centered preaching. Christ-centered preaching is foundational. The Bible makes no sense without Jesus Christ. The life, death, and resurrection, I would add ascension of Jesus, is the key to under to unlocking the mystery of the grand narrative of the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The main biblical themes find their significance in light of G- Jesus. If you're talking about sin, you're talking about covenant, you're talking about mission, salvation, redemption, community, God's people, glory, all of these find their significance uh, most clearly in the person and work of Jesus. Uh, you know, The Bible is a unified and diverse book. Uh, you think about the prophets, you think about the writings of Moses, the law, the wisdom literature, the gospels, the, the epistles. All of it is, is pointing to a central theme. It contains a central theme that is God's mission of salvation in Jesus Christ. In a, in a later lecture, we're going to talk about what typology and biblical theology are and why they're so essential for um, new preaching in the New Testament. But... You know, typology is looking and asking the question, you know, what uh, things or people or events um, teach us about who God is and yet point to something greater uh, or help us to better understanding a spiritual truth that happens later on. You think about like a typology, you think about like a king. You know, uh, we can understand the importance of a king in the Old Testament. You know, Jesus, um, uh, uh, God gives his his people a, a king and the kings are supposed to rule and supposed to rule faithfully but even king david as we see uh later on in the new testament even david king david a man after god's own heart was pointing to a greater king um a, a king who would be flawless and would be righteous and who would defeat all of his enemies uh, biblical theology is the same thing, understanding the theology of the Bible uh, from within the Bible. What what does uh, the Gospel of Luke teach us about kingdom, right? Um, and how does that relate to other aspects of the Bible um, and their theology? Using When we use typology and biblical theology, um, interpreters and preachers are able to interpret and proclaim all Scripture in light of Jesus and His work on the cross. We need to understand how the Bible fits together and yet how it's also different in order to week after week faithfully preach Christ-centered sermons, gospel-centered sermons, and, and then not to have them have the, the same exact makeup every single week. Christ-centered preaching is also practical. We need to preach Christ in our sermons because Christians and non-Christians both need the truth of the gospel. Our goal in every sermon should not only be to share the good news of Jesus Christ, the hope, peace, and joy, and love we can find in the cross, um, and and you know we're preaching that for non-believers to hear that and respond. But also, we need to encourage Christians that wherever we're preaching from, it is significant to them in their life, to their beliefs, to their worship, to their Christian living, um, and that that's that's the practical side of it. Rather than only preaching imperatives, go and do this. Biblical, Christ-centered preaching also involves preaching indicatives. This has already been done. Therefore, one of our main goals in in Christ-centered preaching is to help our people understand the difference Christ makes in our passage, the significance for them in their life. Now, this is this last two or three slides are kind of the setup for part two, where we're going to dive into uh, our book, Him We Proclaim. But Christ-centered preaching is is practical, um, and and one of the main 
worries that some critics have, and, and rightfully so, because when done poorly, Christ-centered preaching is not always helpful. The the first uh, first thing that we, we need to make sure we're not doing is overlook the actual text itself. So, for example, think about Genesis 22. Now, I know we're we're talking about preaching and teaching the New Testament. Just, just think about Genesis 22 for a second and how easy it is to make this error, to actually overlook the text itself. Why? Because we know the climax. We know what's going to happen. We know that God is going to intervene. He's going to provide a, a goat or a lamb for them. Uh, <clears throat> God is uh, you know, going to, going, to, going to save Isaac's life and, and how well that translates and, and points to Jesus. But I've heard it before where the, the pastor, I mean, Genesis 22 is kind of a, a lengthy story, and it's a great story, but they spent about five to ten minutes preaching Genesis 22 before they got to Jesus. And in doing so, they didn't build up the tension. They didn't tell the story. They didn't help the, the hearers to understand the full significance of what it means to trust God and to be faithful to God even when He asks you to do the, the unthinkable um, and and how his love and grace and intervening, providing, sustaining, uh, changes everything for us. Uh, we do not want to overlook the actual text itself, and you know we can be tempted to do that in the New Testament too, where we just you know Paul writes about um, loving one another, and rather than actually preaching the passage and and going in depth about why. It's significant, and why Paul is teaching that we jump straight to, uh, you know, John three sixteen, and we overlook the actual text itself. That's not being faithful to the text. Um, the The desire to get to Jesus is good and, and right, but we've got to do it faithful, just the way Jesus did and the the apostles did. Number two, they they worry that Christ centered preaching will make every sermon sound the same. If if every single sermon is well, Jesus did this perfectly so you don't have to, right? Then then that can get kind of like a broken record. And we see that a lot in the Old and both the, the New Testament and the Old Testament. A lot in the New Testament when preaching the Gospels, that it's easy, you know, when we're preaching the same sort of stories over and over, um, and we might have the same sort of significance or application for each of the sermons. But as we're going to see in our next lecture, um, if we are doing good typology and good biblical theology and we have a good grasp of Scripture and understand the bigger picture of Scripture, um, then making every sermon sound the same is not going to be something that we wrestle with. Why? Because all of Scripture is beneficial. And if, if we understand the passage as it is and the we're, we're depending on the Holy Spirit to better understand our people, we're going to have lots of different ways to point people to Jesus, whether Jesus fulfilled something or Jesus is our righteousness or uh, Jesus is our, our model. There's so many different ways we can do it that we're going to talk about in our next one. So this is just sort of the primer um, of thinking about if the whole Bible is ultimately pointing to or flowing out of the person and work of Jesus Christ, then how can we explain and apply our passage in light of Jesus? That's what we're wanting to get to as faithful ministers of the gospel. This is part one. Part two is going to go more in depth. Thank you for joining me. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to reach out. God bless.